All right, it is noon, and so we will get started. Um, I think, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. All right. Hello and welcome everyone to our lunch and learn on RSV and flu. Uh, just to go over some housekeeping things to let you know about. Uh, webinar attendees will be automatically muted for the presentation. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. We will be recording this presentation and we'll leave time in the end to address any questions you may have along with the questions that came in during the registration. Uh, after the presentation, a link to the recording will be sent out along with an evaluation survey to complete. So my name is Mary Lizakowski and I am a Coalition Health Director with the Foundation for a Healthy North Dakota. It is a newly established nonprofit in North Dakota with a small and mighty team. Our mission is to promote health and wellness by working at the community level across North Dakota. We are building a statewide coalition to allow local communities to collaborate and work together on common initiatives. By joining the coalition, members will be first to know about educational opportunities, the latest on relevant public health information, legislative updates and access to digital advocacy resources and toolkits. Now is my pleasure to introduce our speak our presenters today. Dr. Nagpal completed his medical school at Pasturba Medical College, Magdalore, India, followed by a master's in public health from Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green, Kentucky. He sub subsequently completed uh, an internal medicine residency from the University of North Dakota in an infectious disease fellowship from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He has been working as a consultant in infectious disease at Sanford Health since 2013. In addition to providing clinical services, he is a clinical associate professor at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. He is also the medical director for infection prevention at Sanford, as well as a consultant for the Sanford Kidney Transplant Program. Dr. Nagpal is married and has two daughters and his hobbies include traveling and photography. Our second presenter is Amy Garneau, who, is, who was born and raised in the Turtle Mountains, located in the north central portion of North Dakota. She has been married for 28 years and has three children and four grandchildren. And she is here today to share her story on how RSV affected her youngest grandchild, Molly. So thank you both for being here today, and I will turn it over to Dr. Nagpal to give his presentation. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and giving me uh, time um, and webinar space to present here. Um, let me see. Let's put up our presentation here. Hopefully everybody is able to see the slides here. Um, I see a couple uh, of heads nodding, so we'll jump right into it. So first we'll talk about influenza and RSV. And oh, can... can I pause you for one second, Dr. Nick? Yeah. I'm not seeing the, the slides quite yet. I can hear okay. you, but I can't see them. All right, let's see. How about now? I can see your slides. Um, yep, sure can. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll uh, first talk about influenza and then jump into RSV. And I've been told to uh, keep my presentation down to 35 minutes and I want to respect the time limit. So uh, when we hit the 35 minute mark, tell me to shut up, please. Um, so uh, no financial disclosures. Uh, I'll be discussing some vaccines, uh, both uh, which are currently available and the ones that are in development. But 
uh, I've not been financially reimbursed or don't have any kind of working relationship with the pharmaceutical companies or the manufacturers of the medical products. So um, I thought it would be nice to start with a history of pandemics and how uh, these uh, continue to shape our human history um, before COVID-19 became the topic of all pop culture discussions. Influenza epidemic of 1918 was the um, the modern pandemic that uh, defined uh, our definition of a pandemic and uh, how we approached it. And, and this is something that no, nobody wants to see and we want to avoid at all costs. I think this is the picture that was published in one of our medical journals recently, and it's a stark reminder of when a new virus or a bacteria is introduced into a community where nobody has previous uh, immunity or nobody, uh, we are all immune naive, um, it can really lead to a path of very quick dis um, destruction here. Um, and this was exactly our um, uh, you know, worry with COVID-19 pandemic uh, that our health systems, which uh, function at a fairly optimal e and efficient level like any other business um, here um, can easily get overwhelmed when a lot of people end up in our ERs or hospitals and then uh, we don't have um, uh, you know, uh, resources to provide care for so many patients at the same time. So deaths can accumulate very rapidly if, if they don't get treatment in time. So, uh, and this slide again, you know, um, describes um, or outlines all the uh, pandemics that we have had in order of the timeline and the mortality. So the biggest pandemic that has been documented and was that of the Black Death, which wiped about a third of Europe's population in the Middle Ages. And then uh, after that came smallpox, which devastated a lot of Central and North American population. Uh, and then um, as we talked about the modern pandemic, that was the 19, 1918 influenza pandemic, also known as Spanish flu, not because uh, it was it, not because it started in Spain or was described in Spain. It just happened to be noticed in Spanish uh, press a lot uh, earlier than uh, other other media outlets all over the world. Um, so as you can see, um, the deaths from um, influenza pandemic of 1918 amounted to 40 to 50 million in, in about a single year. Uh, so far, we have had uh, over three seasons total deaths from COVID-19 approaching 7 million. So that was, uh, so influenza has uh, the potential to cause a lot more deaths. Um, and you can argue that any respiratory virus, a new one or a new evolution of a previous virus can, can replicate what happened in 1918. So we always have to be um, uh, ready in a state of preparedness. So <clears throat> let's talk about influenza first. This is just a graphic that is, um, that shows you influenza cells uh, attaching to and invading the um, uh, a host cell. Uh, influenza um, virus is one of the many respiratory viruses that causes uh, respiratory symptoms, pneumonias, and whatnot. Uh, and it basically, um, uh, we have three different varieties of influenza virus that are common, A, B, and C, but A and B are the ones that cause human infections uh, for the most part. And these um, give rise to predictable annual pandemics. Uh, the, the influenza peak may vary from season to season, but we see a pretty consistent trend of a significant amount of influenza cases in the winter months. And, and the challenge with all these respiratory viruses, <clears throat> whether it's influenza or RSV, is that they continue to evolve constantly um, and, and, uh, um, and try to evade the protection that we had, whether uh, whether that's our inherent immunity from previous infections or immunity that we get from vaccinations or um, treatment targeted towards them. So we live in this delicate balance with our nature where uh, we are constantly evolving and um, uh, the, the germs around us are constantly evolving. Uh, we as humans, you know, um, our lifespans are 70 to 80 years. So we don't have the luxury of evolving as quickly as uh, in, as these viruses. So what we do is we try to um, uh, outgun them by uh, our preventive and therapeutic techniques. And we'll discuss uh, about those in a minute. Uh, what this slide shows is the annual burden of influenza, including number of cases, diagnosed cases, um, and hospitalizations and deaths. So 
looking at this slide, you can easily see that there are millions and millions of cases every year and hundreds and thousands of hospitalizations and uh, tens of thousands of deaths every year. So the deaths and hospitalizations just represent the, uh, the um, visible portion of the uh, uh, iceberg here. And this slide just summarizes all the information over the um, last 10 influenza seasons that I uh, showed you in the previous slide. Um, on a, on in any given year, <clears throat> you can uh, you have millions of cases. So you know, estimate is that uh, over the last decade we have had uh, anywhere between 10 to 40 million cases of influenza, uh, leading to uh, hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations, and you know, uh, uh, about uh, leads to on an average uh, 15 to 45 thousand, or in this slide as it says, 12,000 to 52,000 deaths annually. Uh, that's quite a quite a huge number. And this is how influenza has behaved this year. Um, we kind of saw the early peak. Um, usually we peak sometime in Jan, February, uh, but uh, this time uh, we saw a peak towards, uh, uh, you know, right before Christmas. And uh, since then we have had a rapid decline in cases. So we are towards the tail end of the influenza season, hopefully if there is not another peak because we still have some time uh, to go before influenza season officially ends. This is um, um, the graphs of uh, influenza epidemics that we see every year. The only outlier is the pink line here, um, which represents the 2020-21 season where we did not have any significant influenza activity thanks to all the masks and social distancing, but that those things are not uh, feasible long-term. So uh, as soon as those go away, uh, the, uh, we, we, we have this uh, uh, black line with uh, red triangles representing um, influenza um, trend this year, and then the orange line, which was representing influenza trend uh, from last year. So as you can see, very predictable uh, towards the end of the year, beginning of uh, end of previous year and beginning of the next year, we see peak influenza activity. We just had um, influenza season come on significantly earlier this year. So one of the problems that we encounter as providers in getting a message across about influenza is because the most common term that we use is flu for any respiratory illness. And respiratory illness can be caused by any, any uh, not I shouldn't say any virus, a large number of respiratory virus, whether it's rhinovirus, adenovirus, RSV, influenza, uh, COVID-19, or the non-COVID-19 coronaviruses. So most of these infections will cause common cold. And this is also referred to flu in pop culture. And then when this happens, uh, this doesn't cause uh, moderate or severe symptoms. And then um, then we uh, tend to think that influenza is not very uh, significant illness or not a deadly illness, but, but it's very different from common cold illness. In, a common cold uh, is an illness uh, caused by respiratory viruses, but it only gives you local symptoms, typically, you know, throat pain, stuffy nose, uh, sneezing. Um, but influenza is a more systemic illness, which means uh, it affects your entire body. And the uh, the things that differentiate influenza from common cold are uh, the the illness is sudden in onset. So one day you are feeling fine and the other day you feel like you can't move and you can't do anything and you're ha having high grade fever and chills, which is typically not the case in common cold and body aches. Probably the most prominent symptom of influenza. You have so much body aches that it's hard to even get up and brush your teeth or sit down to eat. And <clears throat> and uh, some people describe that as uh, bony aches, muscle aches. What that typically means is that influenza is running through your body and causing severe, severe uh, myalgias or muscle pain, causing lethargy and fatigue, which is significantly more um, severe than what you see in common cold. So what happens with influenza is not just that the Local symptoms or fever is more common. These are all mild symptoms that you can probably still manage at home. Influenza is related with a lot more uh, complications, whether those are moderate complications in the form of sinus or ear infection, which may sometimes require antibiotics. 
But what we worry about most is the severe symptoms that uh, uh, make you end up in the hospital, uh, like um, um, myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle. Um, this can cause arrhythmias or heart attack. Encephalitis, which is uh, influenza affecting your brain, which can cause seizures. Myositis, which is a very common symptom or complication, I should say, uh, seen in children where their muscles stiffen up, specifically for the legs, and and um, uh, they they get very rigid and they cannot move or get get up. Then we have to admit them, administer them IV fluids, correct their electrolytes, give them muscle relaxants, and with time, uh, fortunately, most of these things do get better. Um, um, but what actually leads to real mortality and morbidity is pneumonia. Once influenza evolves into a pneumonia, there's a high risk that you can end up in the hospital. Once you do, if the pneumonia continues to get more severe and more problematic or more progressive, you can end up on, in a, on a ventilator and sometimes um, uh, you get septic from it. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Once you get septic from the pneumonia, your blood pressure can fall, and then you can have all the domino effect of that problem, and that includes um, uh, um, kidney failure, which may require dialysis or a heart attack or stroke, um, a phenomenon we call a multi-organ failure. So this is the most frequent uh, cause of death in influenza. When you um, develop a severe pneumonia, you have to be put on a ventilator and and your other organs can be affected because you're not getting enough oxygen in your body. So who is at high risk of flu-related complications or influenza-related complications? This is a graphic from Pennsylvania Department of Health uh, and, and very nicely depicts that uh, people who have uh, lower immunity uh, typically are at highest risk of complications from influenza. And these are uh, these are children who are newborn. Uh, you know, all children less than five can have complications from influenza, but particularly uh, infants and uh, those less than two years of age, uh, they are the ones who, who have an immature immune system. And then as we age, once we, once, we, uh, once we are 65, 70 years of age, our immunity starts to go down as well. It doesn't disappear overnight, but it's not as robust uh, as uh, it was, say, in your prime of your life or in your 30s or 40s. Uh, well, once you are 65 or more, then you, have, then you have increased risk of complications from influenza. That's just a medical fact and not limited to influenza. You see that in many other infections too. Um, and pregnant women, why specifically pregnant women? So what happens is uh, once you're pregnant, your body dials down the immunity on purpose automatically to protect um, the unborn baby in your womb uh, so that your body's own immunity doesn't recognize that as a foreign object or a foreign body and then start attacking it. So, so, uh, so your body automatically dials down your immunity, uh, reduces it by, say, 10 or 15%. And that can be enough to disturb the normal host virus balance of power and a virus can easily take over and cause increased morbidity and mortality. And then of course, uh, people with certain health conditions uh, where we artificially lower their immunity. And these are people who require uh, certain medications like chemotherapy, which reduces your immunity or uh, immunosuppressive agents for autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or certain GI diseases like Crohn's disease. So the underlying mechanism in these diseases is that your body's immunity is overactive um, and kind of causing harm to your own tissues. And how we approach those diseases is by dialing down your immunity so that um, the inflammatory response can settle down as an extension of the same side effect, once your immunity is lowered, it can be lowered up to a certain level that uh, once you get an infection, you have more risk of complications. So these are typical um, uh, uh, patient groups who are at higher risk of complications. Now you can argue, well, that's a very um, a small group of uh, people. So um, why do we need to immunize everybody? As COVID-19, well, first of all, it's not a small uh, group of people. Let's go forward a few slides and show you. Uh, hmm. 
And I do not know what happened to that. Anyway, I had a graphic, maybe we'll find it later in our presentation where it shows the uh, percentage of population of North Dakota that is, uh, that is uh, below five years of age or more than 65 years of age. And that's a good 20 to 25% of our population. So a fifth to a quarter of a population falls in the high risk uh, group. And this is not including the pregnant women and people with autoimmune conditions. So, so, so this is not a small group of patients. And then as COVID-19 has taught us, um, you cannot isolate one specific group of individual and other people can go about doing their job. Viruses don't uh, respect artificial boundaries. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, despite lockdowns and everything, we saw outbreaks in the nursing home and things like that. So, and, and isolation is hard, not just for working people, but also for people uh, who are elderly uh, because they need, and you can argue that they need uh, human contact more than a working population because we anyway um, go and talk to our colleagues and our friends at work. Um, so, so these are some images of the x-rays and CTs that I want to share with you. Um, what you see here is a complication of influenza called pneumonia. Uh, if you look at the right side, which is this side of the x-ray, these white shadows, these are ribs, and the lung is supposed to be black because it's filled with air. So you can see nice and black lung on the right side, but if you look at the left side, half the lung is, is, uh, is suffering a whiteout. And this is nothing but a pneumonia where um, all the inflammation and infection is causing fluid to seep out into the lung spaces. And basically the lower part of left lung is not, um, is not able to um, exchange carbon dioxide for oxygen. So, <coughs> excuse me. So you are basically uh, functioning on one and a half lung um, and your half lung is not serving the purpose of um, uh, oxygenating your body. Now this pneumonia, uh, the last one was only limited to one lobe of the lung, but it can quickly overwhelm your body once it sets in and can involve all parts of your lungs. So what you see here is complete whiteout in both of your lungs. This patient is obviously, as you can see from the other shadows, these are all um, uh, respiratory support devices or, uh, uh, or invasive lines for fluids and medications and uh, EKG. Um, monitoring strips here. Um, so so this is this person is in ICU requiring intense life support because um, the body has stopped uh, the lungs have stopped oxygenating the body. So so th this this uh, will cause further downstream side effects. Um, once your your organs are not receiving the oxygen, your kidneys can fail, your you can have a heart attack, you can have a stroke. So because every organ needs oxygen to survive. Uh, these are more complications of influenza. What has happened here is that the lungs are so filled with fluid uh, that they have suffered a puncture and there is air leaking out of the lung and surrounding the heart. So what this air is doing is there's a, this is a one-way leak of the air out of the lungs. And what this will, air will eventually do is it will collapse the lung and put pressure on the heart compromising your clinical situation even further because not only you're not oxygenating, but you're not, not able to pump even the less oxygenated blood because of all the pressure from air that's trapped in your chest cavity. So the way we approach this is by putting a chest tube to let this air out so your lungs can expand and your heart can pump. So these are all complications that can easily happen with influenza once pneumonia sets in place. So, so what's what's unique about influenza? Why 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 do we struggle with influenza every year? Why are we always one step behind with the vaccines? Why, despite so many vaccine year after year, why why are we at risk of another influenza pandemic? And the reason for that is this: a phenomenon called antigenic shift. So, so there are two phenomena that occur in influenza viruses. Uh, this is a normal influenza virus, uh, and this is its RNA, which codes its genetic material. And as you can see, these are short segments, which are not in one single RNA. It's a split RNA. It has eight segments, and it codes for all these proteins um, um, that, that help the virus attach to the host cell. So 
So what happens is that if a chicken influenza virus or avian influenza virus comes into contact with a human influenza virus in the same host, they are replicating so quickly, so efficiently. I shouldn't say efficiently because that's the problem with the viruses. They are, they are very tiny particles which have only one function, which is to produce more viruses. They have given up every function, every other function like breathing, eating, digesting. The only purpose uh, that they know uh, of what to do is to replicate and they replicate very, very quickly. And they don't have a um, proofreading mechanisms like we do because we in our lifetimes will have anywhere from zero to, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, seven, eight babies at the most or 10 babies at the most. Uh, uh, so, and, and most of those uh, individuals will live up to 70 to 80 years of age. So, so our DNA is very complex and has a foolproof me um, foolproofing mechanism uh, built into uh, our reproductive systems uh, because we bear only certain amount of children in our lifetime. So we better make sure the body better make sure that whatever is replicating is, uh, is able to survive. That doesn't happen with influenza viruses. Many of the viruses, uh, sometimes they get partial gene transfer, they die off. But because the, uh, the influenza virus is replicating millions of times in any given minute, um, there will always be more virus particles that are able to survive. And sometimes what will happen is that it, the, you will see a new influenza virus that acquires seven or six genes from the human virus and one or two genes from the chicken virus. And then it will become a completely new strain of influenza virus. And then these new genes um, uh, you know, lead to completely new proteins. So it's barely recognizable by our immune system. And then when once it um, acquires ability to uh, replicate and transfer from one person to another, it is as if your body is dealing with a completely new virus to which it has no previous immunities from prior infections or vaccinations. And every time that happens, fortunately, that doesn't happen very often. It happens once in a few decades. And But once it happens, it always, always, always leads to very high number of cases, very high number of hospitalizations, very high number of deaths, because you're basically introducing a new viral strain in a completely immune-naive population. So, this is how influenza has behaved over the last 100 years from 1918 to 1955. The predominant circulating strain was the Spanish flu virus. Um, the, the H1N1 is, was the technical name for that. And, and it continued uh, till 1955 when we had a new um, uh, strain breakout uh, called H2N2. So this designation is based on hemagglutinin in protein, neuraminidase protein. You don't need to remember those. Nobody can say those. Uh, these are basically the two different types of proteins on the surface of influenza virus, which help it to attach um, and enter the host cell. So this name is based on the characteristics of those two proteins. So they go by the pop culture name of H2N2 or whatever. So, so once the H1N1 was circulating for about three decades. And we had built up some immunity to it. And then suddenly we had this new strain of influenza virus called H2N2. And you can clearly see how many excess all cause deaths it caused in its first year. Then it starts to go down uh, because we are having uh, either vaccine immunity from vaccination or immunity from infections, and then it changes again to H3N2, and then you see a, um, a, a spike in the mortality and number of cases again. Then uh, this era continued, and then the 1980, in the 1918 virus made a comeback as well. This time, um, mortality didn't go up very high immediately as compared to the previous years because we had uh, some residual immunity from previous infections, and and uh, over the years, what happens is there is a slow change in their evolution. It's called antigenic drift instead of a shift. So it's a little different, not very different, 
So you have some immunity to it, if not complete immunity. So, but sometimes those changes in viral proteins are more some years as compared to other years. So you will see some years we have higher mortality, some years we have lower mortality. And then the latest one that we had, the new H1N1, which occurred in 2009, that caused a lot of strain on our healthcare system uh, in, in subsequent one to three years. And, and now we are in the era which, where we continue to deal with it. And every time there's an avian influenza outbreak like we are seeing this year, our worry is always that it's going to combine with the circulating influenza virus and give rise to a new strain. So we always have to be prepared. So, so <clears throat> why is immunity important? This is a slide that uh, depicts what happens when you have immunity or what happens when you don't have immunity. Say you do have no immunity whatsoever, your body has not seen a virus previously, you're starting from zero, the, this is the red line that indicates your immunity, it takes some time to build up before it reaches protective level, and that's when replication uh, uh, of the virus goes down because your immunity is stopping it in its track eventually. Uh, and then once the virus replication stops, then you slowly start recovering from your symptoms. Now compare that to somebody who has had a previous vaccination or a previous infection. What you see here is that you already have some immunity. So it starts kicking in as soon as the virus uh, enters your body or your body is exposed to the virus. What that does is it significantly decreases the amount of replication of the virus and the time of the replication of the virus. And uh, in doing that, it reduces your disease severity, disease duration quite a bit. But the problem is that um, because vaccines are not 100% protective in preventing infection, uh, because these viruses are constantly evolving, there is always some chance that uh, under pressure from immunity and treatment, uh, the virus is trying to survive and it will evolve and mutate and, and, uh, and, and will get what we call as escape variant, the phenomenon that we are seeing with COVID-19 virus right now, because you are having multiple escape variants of Omicron, uh, but, um, but not many people are getting sick because we have some kind of immunity from, from before. So as long as we are able to uh, uh, unless and until there is uh, a new variant, I think we will continue to uh, do okay, and it will continue to be a mild disease except in high-risk populations uh, till we get a new major uh, variant breakthrough. So uh, I think uh, uh, we are running a little slow, so uh, I'll quickly go over influenza vaccines. I don't want this to be too technical. I just want to uh, just give you a few examples of what influenza vaccines do and do not do. So sometimes our expectation from vaccine is that it will stop all the infections, but remember the viruses are constantly evolving. So, um, so they are also trying to survive. So whatever immunity they are uh, coming across in your body, they will try to escape that immunity. And that leads to a little change every year in the, in the viral structure. So even though you may, uh, uh, you may not be able to get full protection from the infection, what they basically do is uh, prevent you from getting severely sick, ending up in the hospital or dying uh, from the disease. And even if you get the infection, the duration of symptoms and the intensity of symptoms is fairly short. So you can go back to work and taking care of kids or you know, traveling, whatever you want to do much earlier um, if, uh, in, uh, as opposed to if you were not vaccinated. So we do recommend influenza vaccine to everybody who's six months and older. Uh, and, uh, and it is only moderately effective in preventing influenza, but it helps uh, to uh, quite a bit of extent in reducing complications, including hospitalization and death. The problem is that you know, um, many people get vaccination fatigue because it's an annual vaccine uh, and, uh, and it's a poke. Uh, you have to go to a doctor or a, a pharmacy to get the vaccine. And then with widespread uh, misinformation, vaccine hesitancy is also playing a role in, uh, in decreasing uptake of the vaccine. So, so, so that, 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 that adds to the challenge for emergency preparedness as far as fighting pandemics is concerned. These are just some stats. I don't want to spend too much time on this. There are links on this um, uh, you know, uh, presentation will be available to you after the webinar. So if you want to 
uh, read in more detail, you can certainly do that. Uh, but uh, these are just some numbers on <clears throat> how influenza vaccines help us, uh, all of us, um, whether we are patients or whether we are hospitals who are planning to take care of patients. If you are vaccinated, um, you know, uh, as I said, it won't prevent all the infections, but uh, there is a, a 40, uh, 40 to 60 percent decrease in the need for a doctor visit um, in during uh, seasons where the influenza vaccine is a good match. Um, and it, uh, when, when, when that is the case, millions and millions of infections and thousands of deaths and hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations are prevented. Again, another study that shows that um, uh, um, vaccinated adults had a, um, uh, almost a, a third uh, uh, less of a risk of ICU admission or death if they were vaccinated. Um, um, Eighty-two percent reduction in hospitalization, or oh, sorry, in ICU admission when the vaccine is a good match, and a forty percent reduction in hospitalization risk um, on an on an average uh, when taken over seven years from two thousand nine to two thousand sixteen. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about mechanisms of protection. Uh, by uh, uh, vaccinating pregnant mothers. But as I said, infants don't have a mature immune system yet, so, so they are one of the highest risk um, uh, uh, highest risk groups uh, to suffer complications from these respiratory infections. So the strategy is if you um, immunize the mommies, then they will pass on protective antibodies to their infants and continue to do so in, in their breast milk. So when, when we do that, uh, we find that about um, uh, the risk of uh, influenza-associated respiratory infection can decrease by almost up to a half. And, um, and again, uh, taken over a longer period of time so as to include good years and bad match years for the influenza vaccine on an average, the risk of hospitalization of a pregnant woman from influenza goes down by about 40% if they are vaccinated. So uh, I'm already getting a, a signal that we only have five minutes left. So I'll quickly talk about RSV. Um, this is another influenza-like virus which causes respiratory infections. It's a completely different virus though. It has different proteins. Remember, influenza has H and N proteins, but this one has G and F protein. The most important one is F protein. The G protein helps attachment and F protein provides the ability to fuse with the host cell. So what the virus does is uh, not only it, it fuses with the host cell to release its DNA and utilize the host uh, uh, cellular components to make new viruses, but instead of jumping from one cell to another, it forms a huge mass of cells that fuse together to form a syncytium, as you see here, and that's why it's called respiratory syncytial virus. That's how it derives its name. So uh, again, uh, people at highest risk of illness are infants and adults more than 65 years of age and immunocompromised and uh, add pregnant women uh, to that list too. And this is the graphic I was looking for, the people who are uh, less than five years of age and more than 65 years of age make a good, uh, you know, 20 to 25 percent uh, of North Dakota's population. So that's a huge chunk of people who are at risk of complications. Uh, uh, and then add to them people uh, who are pregnant in any given year and people who are getting chemotherapy or immunosuppressive therapy. And that number easily reaches up to a third of the population. So similar thing with RSV, as we see with influenza, uh, predictable uh, outbreaks, um, uh, predictable epidemics every year in winter time, uh, fall time. So, so far we haven't had much treatment and prevention options for RSV, but that's changing very, very rapidly. Uh, this, we are entering a golden age of RSV vaccine uh, uh, and other preventive strategies. And the reason for that now is um, we have tests that are more readily available. Uh, we have data tools that can um, uh, accumulate data in real time. So we see how much global burden there is of RSV uh, as compared to other respiratory viruses. Now it's one of the leading causes of respiratory illnesses, especially in children. 
And now we understand better interaction between the virus and humans. And we have done structural mapping of the fusion protein, the most important protein that helps cause the infection. So monoclonal antibodies and virus uh, 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 vaccines against virus are targeted towards this specific protein. So we, we now know uh, what to target to prevent uh, infection or its complications. And this is preliminary data. Uh, three different pharmaceutical companies uh, are working on a vaccine. Uh, different vaccines we all seem to have 80 to 85 percent efficacy in reducing severe lower respiratory tract disease, which means uh, if you get RSV, your risk of developing pneumonia or getting into the hospital from that goes down to 80 to 85 percent. That's that's very high efficacy as far as uh, any vaccine is concerned. But uh, but you know, as I said, this is preliminary data. Uh, this is still in clinical trials. So once uh, the trials are completed in the next uh, one to three years, uh, we'll, we'll see what the data shows. They are typically uh, published in a medical journal and undergo a thorough peer review process. So, so this is, uh, uh, we'll, we'll see where this leads us. Um, but uh, the latest data, we peer reviewed data that we have already published is about a vaccine that we give to pregnant mommies uh, just prior to the RSV season, and with this, um, and this is not a new strategy. We do this for tetanus, pertussis, and influenza uh, previously. And if you add RSV vaccine during pregnancy, what we see is about 80% reduction in severe uh, RSV disease in the first three months. And as we go further, the num the amount of antibodies transferred from mommies to babies at the time of uh, gestation or uh, during breastfeeding goes down over time. So the efficacy decreases over the next six months, but it still remains at around 70%. So, so this is a very promising preliminary result. Uh, there will be a phase three trial. This vaccine will advance to that and uh, hopefully um, uh, we'll have similar results in a more broader trial too. But vaccine development is hard. You only hear about the vaccines that eventually make it uh, through the trials, vigorous clinical trials phase, preclinical pre phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, and then are published. But, uh, but there are many vaccines which, uh, which, uh, which do not make it to the market despite extensive um, uh, preclinical data. And this is an example of another vaccine manufactured by a different uh, um, a pharmaceutical company that did not, did not sh make much of a difference. The last thing that I want to talk about is monoclonal antibodies. Um, you know, these are treatments that have been in use for cancer chemotherapy for a long time uh, with a uh, good amount of success. And now they are crossing over to the infectious disease world. Uh, we have already seen a lot of monoclonal antibodies um, uh, uh, released for COVID-19 um, uh, treatment and prevention. Uh, and we have similar antibodies for Ebola, malaria, um, anthrax, um, uh, C. diff, and now we are uh, seeing some um, uh, monoclonal antibodies for RSV as well. The first one that was developed, this was some time ago, but the uptake has been really low because it's a monthly injection. You have to do a monthly injection over five to six months of the RSV um, uh, circulation time in the year during fall and winter months, and it's expensive, so, it, uh, so, so uptake has been very low, but more recently, uh, there are a couple new monoclonal antibodies and these have shown to be effective um, and they, they are long acting, so you only need to inject them once in a season rather than monthly. So, so we are hopeful and uh, that, uh, and that the uptake will be more for this one, uh, Nercivimab, uh, and this is, uh, I expect this to be available anytime soon now. And what it does, it, it reduces the number of medically attended visits for RSV by 25%, um, and it reduces the hospitalization risk by uh, greater than 40%. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you have uh, ever um, felt um, really angry or uncomfortable after looking at a bill from your provider or a hospital, the best way to get back at them so they don't send you any more bills is getting vaccinated. And I'm the only person on the planet who will tell you uh, to get vaccinated, uh, and that hurts my financial bottom line because I only get paid to see sick people. So this is probably why I'm lecturing here and not at a business school. So I think uh, with that, I will end uh, the presentation right here. 
Sorry for going over time. That's okay. Thank you so much. Um, let's see if you want to stop sharing your screen and then I will turn it over to Amy. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for letting me join and asking me to participate and um, to tell you about Molly's story. Um, Molly is now six months old. She is our youngest grandchildren out of four. She sadly developed RSV twice this season. Um, although she was thankfully not hospitalized, it took a toll on her. Her parents took all of the precautions from preventing Molly from getting RSV, but she still um, contracted it, not once, but twice. <clears throat> My daughter, Brittany, is a stay-at-home mom, so Molly has not been to daycares or pretty much any besides, you know, anywhere besides doctor's appointments in our place. We don't have a local pediatrician in our area. So Molly's, <clears throat> when Molly started to show symptoms, when she was not feeling well, they took her to see her pediatrician in Minot, which is about an hour and a half drive from here. Um, the doctor provided a lot of helpful information to mom and dad about RSV and prescribed her nebulizer treatments. This helped for about two weeks and Molly started to, to feel somewhat better. But about after the third week, Molly started not to feel well again. So I drove her and my daughter back to Mina to see her pediatrician. Um, it was an emergency appointment that she got her into. Again, she was diagnosed with RSV. With Molly having RSV twice, it was hard on her parents and us as grandparents as well. It was also hard on her older siblings. Mom and dad were giving their full attention to Molly to give her the full care that she needed. Um, mom and dad took turns staying awake with Molly during the night as she didn't sleep much. They would have to give her treatments every four hours because if they didn't um, keep up with the treatments, her breathing would get labored. She had a stuffy nose, cough, fever, some wheezing. Um, she wouldn't eat much, so they would keep her hydrated with a lot of Pedialyte. Um, which helped immensely because thankfully she didn't get dehydrated. Mom and dad were very restless and stressed and tired because it takes a toll on, you know, on them physically and mentally. Um, so I would go to help out with Molly so they can try to get some rest or try to spend some time with the other kids. Um, with Molly having RSV, it didn't only have an effect on her parents or us, but also her siblings. Uh, we took the older two grandchildren so that they can care for Molly as much as they can. And our four-year-old granddaughter, Emma, had made the comment. Um, she said, Grandma, I wish I was still a tiny baby so that my mom and dad still loved me. It really, it broke my heart um, because, you know, you don't think about the toll that it takes on the other kiddos, but it really does. So I had a talk with her and explained to her that mom and dad loved her very, very much, but Molly was very sick and, and needed her parents um, to care for her and help her because she was just a baby. And once she started feeling better that, you know, her mom and dad would um, start doing the things that they were able to do with her before Molly got sick. So it brought a smile to her face. Um, Molly got better within the next few weeks. Um, she started, the symptoms started gradually going away. Um, but we are thankful that, um, Molly beat RSV twice within a month's period and she didn't need to be hospitalized. Um, we had a, a few babies within our community that were hospitalized they were diagnosed with RSV and were hospitalized. They were actually airlifted to bigger hospitals that were able to provide better care for them. Um, actually, one was one of our family members, and it was a scary situation for them, as I can imagine, because it was scary for us with Molly. Um, I just, I'm thankful for the care that was provided to Molly by her pediatrician, Um I'm thankful for her parents, um, her siblings. My parents helped out quite a bit too. And especially with mom, with Brit my daughter, Brittany, because she's a 
full-time mom. Um, she's a stay-at-home mom and she cares for her children 24 seven. So I see the toll that really took on her um, along with dad. So um, with that, we just were thankful that Molly wasn't hospitalized and that she beat RSV. And we, we hope that she doesn't um, contract it again. We hope that she's you know, maybe becoming more immune to it. I don't, I don't know, but I just hopefully as she gets older, um, because it is a scary situation for the babies, the moms, you know, the families. Um, but I think that's all I have to share. Um, thank you thank for you. listening to our story. <laughs> thank you so much, Amy, for sharing. Um, it kind of brings me back to when uh, my, my oldest had RSV. It just, yeah, it really takes a toll on the family for sure. So thanks so much for joining us and sharing your story. Thank you. Um, so we can now move into questions. Um, and so I can um, pull up the ones that we had um, the pe when people registered. And so the first one is, um, is there education available for staff ER med surge nurses on these topics? Um, Dr. Nagpal, I don't know if you have anything to add. I have looked up some resources, but I think I'll defer to you to see if you know of any. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I'm not sure if they are asking about uh, specific education modules, uh, because plenty of those are available through the CDC website or Infectious Disease Society of America website. Uh, I think what they might be referring to is the CME credited uh, education, uh, which we can probably work on in the uh, with the next few webinars that we we host. Um, I think it's uh, uh, it's a reasonable ask and it's an easy ask to do. But I don't know how much your resources allow. But if the question is uh, about more education. Uh, I included a lot of links, so you can always refer to them. And the CDC has a website uh, called Flu View, uh, which is updated in real time and tracks uh, real time influenza data season after season, and and mm -hmm. and that provides you a lot of um, uh, education material and answers to that. Uh, plus, um, you know, if you if you go to um, other infectious disease websites like uh, Infectious Disease Society of America uh, that has an entire section dedicated to influenza too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so the, another question is the best way to address a parent who is hesitant to get the flu shot and has a newborn on the way? Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, that's something that happens regularly in our clinics here. And I think the key is to uh, recognize that most people are not in uh, vaccine deniers. They are just vaccine hesitant, and they are just looking for um, information. So, so, so try to uh, uh, figure out what their real concern is. What, what's their, uh, what are their personal fears about the vaccine? Whether it's lack of um, information or whether it's something that they read on Facebook or. Uh, Instagram that that uh, a personal story that that kind of uh, gave them a pause uh, about the vaccine and once they have that and they hear from you uh, they don't necessarily need even the most detailed statistics what they want to do uh, is hear from you as a provider that what you recommend so as long as you have the resources you are confident about the vaccines and the way we uh, track our side effects and the benefits and the risk uh, it's 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 easy discussion to have uh, because um, uh, I can do as much, uh, you know, public health education on a community level as I can, but we are all humans with our own experiences and that's what, what defines us as an individual. Addressing that specific individual question or a concern uh, is best done in, uh, in a primary care office or your, uh, if you have, uh, even in specialty offices, if you have a long-term patient, who trust your judgment and your information or take the time to uh, listen to their uh, concern and answer the question. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what are your thoughts on moving away from the traditional egg-based flu vaccines 
and using other platforms such as cell-based ones? Yeah, so I think both the platforms are a little older now. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, egg-based is not that much of a problem uh, in terms of allergy, because if you are able to eat eggs, you should be able to get the um, egg-based vaccine too. The major problem with them is that it takes a lot of time to develop and manufacture a vaccine. If uh, <clears throat> if you are using um, egg cell, uh, like a, a cell culture, um, or you are growing um, uh, a virus or manufacturing an antigen using older cell culture techniques because you have to incubate that for a long period of time. So manufacturing on a large scale and adapting to a rapidly uh, uh, evolving outbreak takes a long time using this, these older techniques. And that's why I think going forward, these newer um, um, vaccination uh, platforms like beat mRNA or adenovirus or recombinant antigens that we use for hepatitis B vaccines, uh, these give us the ability to design and test the vaccines much faster, uh, and we are able to address the pandemics in real time as compared to older platforms, which uh, take a long time to uh, grow the virus and then uh, then kill it and uh, or at least, uh, uh, you know, uh, make it uh, make it attenuated. Uh, so, so, so I think that that's these are good tools to have in our arsenal, so we can respond rapidly to emerging threats. Sure. Um, and then another one is: Do a lot of people take the RSV um, disease seriously? That you've seen. So. Uh, uh, you know, that's that's the other thing that we struggle with, um, because as part of the webinar, even I said that uh, there are uh, people who are at higher risk for complications, and many people hear that and don't perceive themselves to be at higher risk. What we forget is that uh, when I say that these people are not at higher risk, doesn't mean that you are specifically would be at a lower risk. Uh, anybody can get into complications from influenza. We see healthy people end up in the hospital uh, on a ventilator or die from influenza. So don't underestimate your own risk. We, In general, we do tend to underestimate our own risk, whether it's during driving when we are texting or not wearing a seatbelt or um, not getting a vaccination. And also, you know, uh, we always come in contact with um, uh, other people who are at high risk, whenever you see a new baby, you always want to hold them, cuddle them, whether, uh, especially if it's uh, one in your family, uh, you um, may come, you go to a restaurant and you are sitting across uh, a table from an older couple who is there enjoying a meal. So, so you know, uh, we may not be too sick, we may not, um, we may have just mild symptoms from the disease, but we are capable of spreading the disease to a lot of other people too. So, so I think uh, it, it helps not just on an individual level, but on a community level too. Thank you. Um, another one came in. Uh, Dr. Nagpal, can you comment on the H5N1 cases in animals that are popping up around the world? And are you, you concerned at all? Um, yes, most definitely. Um, so, uh, sorry, my camera was off. Um, <laughs> Um, I think I addressed it during the lecture itself. Uh, we have a major uh, outbreak of avian influenza that's just not going away. Uh, and that's um, obviously being reflected in the egg prices that you see uh, in the grocery stores uh, right now, um, because uh, we had to kill a, a lot of our um, um, you know, chicken population. Uh, and yes, uh, it only takes one mutation where the virus human virus combines with a chicken virus. And once it gets the ability to um, uh, start transmitting from person to person, you have a whole new different virus. And that's, uh, uh, that's how pandemics start. So yes, we are worried. We are worried to the point that our infectious disease journals have it as a highlight story. Thank you for that. Another one is what can healthcare providers do now to pre prepare for the nerestimab? late this year? I probably pronounced that wrong. <laughs> so, uh, yes. So, you know, the problem with these newer therapeutics is that they are expensive and are, um, uh, you know, the first thing I would do is to reach out to your uh, uh, health system pharmacy, whether you are uh, in a clinic or in a hospital, and make sure that they know about this so that they can review at the P&T um, um, level 
uh, and see what kind of uh, pathway they have for procuring the medication. And we have the bill uh, to uh, build the insurance plans for this. So the background work, a lot of background work goes into bringing uh, an already manufactured uh, uh, product to um, uh, to the front lines, and that involves a lot of negotiations with pharmaceutical companies. So, so the sooner you can get uh, this to the attention of your um, pharmaceutical representatives in in your um, or your pharmacist in your clinic or hospital, the better it is because we can get the ball rolling. Once we have that out, uh, you know we can easily administer this in the clinic, uh, pediatric clinic, or at an infusion center if the need be. Okay. Um, and then we have another one. Um, uh, so I am, and she says, I'm a nursing, I'm in a nursing major, and I understand the importance of vaccine, and I always recommend them. Is it more or less okay that I don't get many vaccinations, such as flu or COVID? ETC, I don't want our patients at risk, but not, um, but not, not what they're comfortable with. So yeah, I, I get that. So this is, you know, again, uh, we address this a little bit that um, you, you are a young individual in the prime of your health and you are right. The risk of complications from COVID or influenza or RSV in you are, are, are low as compared to say other people. But if you're going to be the nurse, uh, you are always going to take care of patients uh, and many of these patients who ends up in the hospital uh, people who are elderly, typically. You go around a hospital, take a uh, hospital uh, floor, take a census and see how many people are more than 65 years of age. It's more than half or more than 70%. Um, okay, you decide you don't want to work in the general floor, but you go and work in a pediatric floor or an OB floor. That's another high-risk population, newborns and pregnant mothers. Or you don't work in a hospital or clinic anymore, but you want to work in a nursing home that's the highest risk population. So, uh, and, and this is the same reason why, why we tell when we hire staff uh, to work in our hospital, we demand proof of vaccination against measles, mumps, rubella, hepatitis B, because you know the first, uh, the Hippocratic oath that we take is do no harm. And that includes uh, trying our best, um, uh, whatever is in our hands, trying our best to make sure that we don't become uh, carriers and transmitters of disease that can kill our patients. Wonderful. Thank you so much for answering all those questions. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I don't see any others coming in. So I just want to thank everyone for attending the presentation um, and to stay connected with us. You can follow uh, Healthy Nodak uh, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and Foundation for Healthy North Dakota on LinkedIn. Also, to join the coalition, you can visit um, visit the link to stay aware of future webinars and updates on the foundation. And lastly, if you can scan the QR code to complete the evaluation, um, that would be great. We will also include a survey link in the follow-up email you will receive after the presentation. So. Thank you all for joining um, and have a great rest of your day.